I want to return to what you were saying a little bit before, um, or I guess it's connected, but you make a, you differentiate between two forms of liberalism in your book. Um, there's procedural liberalism and uh, egalitarian liberalism, which I think is the kind of the, the mainstream consensus of what they think a liberal is or what liberalism is. To take our audience through that kind of differentiation, if you don't mind. Yes, it's really a, a contrast, <clears throat> Emma, between two different ideas of freedom. Freedom is a central American value. And we hear a lot about freedom these days, especially by uh, Republican candidates who say Democrats are against freedom. So uh, there is a kind of debate about freedom. But what this debate misses are two conceptions of freedom that I I discuss in Democracy's Discontent. There is a, a purely individualist idea of freedom, even you might call it a consumerist idea of freedom, that says, I'm free in so far as I can get what I want, satisfy my desires, consumer welfare. But this is, this, I try to contrast this with what I would call a civic conception of freedom that says being free in the sense of a consumer having access to the abundance of this country and the economy, that matters, but it's not the only thing that matters and it's not the only part of freedom that counts. Really to be free is to have a voice, a meaningful say in how we are governed the civic conception of freedom I describe in the book is the ability to deliberate with fellow citizens about the meaning of a just society and the purposes and ends that we should pursue. And it's that civic conception of freedom, I argue in the book, that's been crowded out by the purely market-based individualist consumerist idea of freedom. Mm. So really, democracy's discontent, I think to address democracy's discontent, we need to revive and reconnect in our politics with the civic tradition, the civic conception of freedom, which means we have to ask what economic arrangements are compatible with self-government and with democracy, which leads to questions about the role of antitrust, reigning in big business, including the tech companies, and giving people a meaningful say as citizens, not only as consumers, in how our collective life will be determined. It, it, it's so well said, and it really is, I would say, um, I, mean, I was born in the 90s. I think since the 90s on, the conception of one's citizenship in the United States, even in protest, is so connected to one's consumer consumer choices that you know the civic uh flexing of one's citizenry in like the mid 20th century in protest and in action is so radically different than what my generation perceives of its ability to use its power in in the US in the 21st century which is so based on consumption that I feel like there needs to be some sort of renaissance where millennials and the younger generation understands how to be civic participants, even if we're so atomized and even if, uh, you know, our economic system feels so many layers separated from our practical day to day realities. Yes. And it's not easy to lean against the forces and the habits of consumerism uh, as exhausting our conception of what it means to be free which raises the question, well, how, how might we begin to do that? I think we see, and I try to show in, in the book, how in moments in our past, there have been powerful social movements that involved genuine political debate about big questions in a way that gathered people together. The civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s is one example the movement the uh, anti-vietnam war protest movement was another more recently the black lives matter movement that uh, gained momentum in the aftermath 
of the George Floyd killing. These are glimmers of a civic ambition. Um, all involve conflict, all involve struggles for justice, and all involve political debate and argument. So the civic conception of freedom uh, is compatible with disagreement, with pluralism, with challenging uh, existing arrangements. But in these moments, I think we're recalled to an older civic tradition of freedom. And then there are other institutions within civil society we could debate and consider as ways of shifting our civic education away from a purely consumerist orientation. Some have, have proposed, and I have sympathy for it, but I'd, int I'd be interested to know, Emma, what you think, some kind of universal national service program mm. might like be Like in Scandinavia, way. right. Well, right. what do you think? Would you, would you be sympathetic? I would that? be, as long as it's, you know, I'm on the left. I, I would love for it to be civil service that's not a funnel into, say, you know, the military, for example. I... I, I I, I have my fears about that, but right. that's honestly, you know, my my grandfather was a was a socialist, and that's what he would tell me when I was a kid that, that it was so much better because my grandma was from Finland. How over there they would require civil service, and and that would bring people a, a better conception of of citizenry. And I'm I've always been sympathetic to that kind of idea. Um, right. But and it could be broadened beyond military service to include other forms of of service, whether in, in uh, providing forms of care, the healthcare industry, education, um, the building of infrastructure, there, there are lots of things we need. We need more public investment in general, both in fiscal terms, but also I think in, in human terms and in ways that elicit participation, but also, and this is as important as the projects themselves, that bring people from different backgrounds, different class backgrounds, different ethnic and racial and religious backgrounds into shared experiences, common projects. Uh, because part of uh, one of the most corrosive effects of the inequalities that have been widening in recent decades is that those who are affluent and those who are of modest means increasingly live separate lives. We send our kids to different schools. We, we live and work and shop and play in different places. And this isn't good for democracy. Democracy doesn't require perfect equality, but it does require that people from different backgrounds encounter one another in the course of their everyday lives. Because this is how we learn to, to negotiate and to abide our differences. And this ultimately is how we come to care for the common good. So rejuvenating the public places and common spaces of shared democratic citizenship. I think that has to be part of any attempt to revive the civic conception of freedom that I, I describe and I'm trying to evoke in the book. How much of it, though, is just strengthening our social institutions? Like, no more charter schools. We're not splitting up our, and again, this is kind of wish fulfillment, but if I were to 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 be queen tomorrow and what what would i determine you know no we're, we're yeah. gonna make the our public institutions as robust as possible um we're not siphoning off public money for a religious school in oklahoma or wherever they're just they're making that decision right now or we're not we're we're, we're going we're gonna have a universal health care system so that the the people are not tether, uh, torn apart by um kind of uh, very individualized private healthcare experiences. I mean, to me, I, I, it seems like that's only part of the equation for you, but I, I think that's such an important part. <laughs> well, what I do think uh, is important is to strengthen public institutions and public provision of essential goods. So that the original idea of the public schools going back to Horace Mann was not only to uh, create schools that would be accessible to those regardless of financial means. That was a very important part of it. But he also took seriously the class mixing character 
of the public schools. And so I think part of what we have to do in rebuilding the civic infrastructure of a, of a shared democratic life is to make public institutions good enough and strong enough and well-funded enough so that everyone will want to participate in them. So the public schools should be good enough and strong enough so that parents from the affluent part of town will want to send their kids there. And public transportation should be good enough and clean enough and reliable enough so that everyone will want to use it. Not only those who can't afford you know, private cars or drivers or something such as that. And I would say, I would say the same for public libraries, public parks and recreational areas, public uh, uh, workout facilities, so that people don't feel the need to secede even from those to uh, enroll in private health clubs. So the health of democracy depends in part on the strength of the public institutions within civil society that not only provide services, but do so in a way that brings us together it's community building, it's civic education by inadvertence in a way, but over time, when we find ourselves in the same spaces and public places, availing, of our, uh, availing ourselves of services and education and healthcare and recreation, we come to see one another as fellow citizens engaged in a common project. And that I think is necessary to any attempt to bring about a politics of the common good. So, yes, I mean, I, I, that was one thing I should have added, the, the, the preponderance of more public spaces. That's so, I mean, I'm here in Brooklyn and or here in New York. It's just this constant conversation about, oh, I don't want to see homeless people on my streets and um, places like coffee shops being cashless because they don't want homeless people using their bathrooms. And it's because we have no public spaces left in this country in many ways anymore. And I think that that is really a lot of what you're talking about here, too, which is the the financialization of our politics, the neoliberal consensus being so hard to break through here.